Hey guys, it's Ben with Ben's Appliances, and I got a fix today for you that I'm actually kind of excited to do. If you have a Samsung refrigerator, and your problem goes like this, we're going to fix it today. You open your fridge up, and you start seeing water in the crisper drawers underneath. Maybe you go online and you find one or two fixes for it, and maybe you replace a drain clip, maybe you unthaw the bottom of the drain pan and then things are okay for a little while or it doesn't fix your water issue at all it only gets worse and then eventually you start seeing a little bit of ice develop on these uh, air ducts here or maybe you take off the evaporator panel here and you see a big ball of ice up here on the unit and there are not a lot of videos documenting a good fix for this it's very elusive, very difficult to deal with. So on today's video, we're going to go through everything you need to fix this permanently. It does take a few items, a, a bit of supplies, but it is fixable, and I'm going to show you how to do it. This fix requires two sets of items to do. The first is the Samsung Excessive Frost Service Kit, and then the second is a Subco Heater. You can either use the SH502 or the 201, and then you need heat resistant cable ties and then these little blue displacement connectors to mesh the new heater onto the regular heater wire. This is the Samsung refrigerator I'm doing the modification to, and I'm skipping the step of taking some of the shelves out. Also the doors were removed when I got this in my shop, so it's going to be a little bit easier to show how this is done, but you don't need to take the doors off to do this. The one shelf though that may give you trouble is the crisper drawer shelf which hides the evaporator panel screws. To take this one out you need to press in on the two retention tabs at the top of the water filter housing then pull up on the shelf to remove it. Typically the evaporator cover on a Samsung refrigerator will have four to five screws that need removed. Two or three are going to be on the very bottom of the cover and then there's going to be two on the metal shelving bracket. Both of these on the bracket may be hidden by plastic screw covers, so make sure to look out for them. Once you have all the screws removed, the cover should be pretty easy to take off, but you may face some resistance if there is a significant amount of ice hidden behind the panel. To remove the evaporator cover, you will need to remove the two wire clusters on the right side of this assembly. The defrost heater wires do not need moved at this time, but you could remove them to splice the new heater on. I don't have a good view of taking these wires out, but there are small retention clips that can be removed with a small screwdriver or just, in my case, your fingers. From the front, I could not tell at all this mess was behind the panel. The big ball of ice is not hiding anything behind itself, but it has caused the evaporator fan to seize up, unable to move, which prevents the refrigerator fan from operating at all. This problem happens often on many Samsung refrigerators, and preventing this ball of ice from forming is what will accomplish a major part of the extensive fix we are doing today. The first stage of this fix is going to deal with the drain system and the drain kit that we purchased. It comes with a few different pieces, two plastic tubes for the drain in the back of the refrigerator, a drain line thermal probe, and then three pieces of padded foil backing for the evaporator system. Using this kit is Samsung's suggested fix for the leaking problem, which works often decently in the case of the drain if it freezes or gets obstructed, but it doesn't really solve the entire ball of ice problem. We are going to use this though because it will possibly fix some problems on most refrigerators. To begin, let's start with the one thing that doesn't actually involve the evaporator system and just go ahead and get it out of the way the drain tubes themselves. You're going to start with a Phillips head screwdriver and remove all the screws keeping the metal or plastic cover panel on the back of the refrigerator on. There are typically 8 to 10 screws that hold it in place which hide the drain tubes, compressor, drain tube tray, and the condenser coils which you should clean in the process of all this to help your fridge run better regardless. To remove the old drain tubes, you simply need to twist a little and then pull down on the old rubber tubes to remove them. And again, when you're done here, make sure to clean the coils because a dirty coil on your system will cause the refrigerator to run harder, longer, costing you more money and could allow the system to have a longer lifespan. 
To insert the new tubes, you'll have an easier time if you insert the tubes on the bottom first as there are small plastic indentations in the drain pan for the new drain tubes to set in. Then, insert the top of the rubber drain tube into the plastic housing on the refrigerator. And once you've got this done, simply reinstall the cover once you've cleaned the coils, which I'm going to do in a little bit off camera. Back now to the refrigerator evaporator system. We are going to remove the metal drain tray to install the foam backed metal foil pieces. To start this, you'll take a screwdriver or I guess a putty knife and use the flat head to slowly work the thin metal pan out of its plastic housing. If you have a long temperature probe in the drain pan, you do want to remove it or otherwise work it out of its place or it could get snagged in the process and then the drain pan will not come out fully. Now this is where it gets a little odd and you can't see what's happening, not just because of the camera angle and my morbid obesity. On the back of the drain pan, there are four tabs that hold the drain pan onto the evaporator coils. These fingers need pried from their locked in positions to allow you to separate the evaporator system from the flimsy metal drain pan. To remove these metal fingers, you can either use a pair of needle nose pliers, a flat bladed screwdriver, or just feel around for them with your own fingers and then bend them back towards the rear of the refrigerator. You can then separate the tray from the evaporator so you can easily install the metal strips behind the evaporator coils. And here is the pan separated from the evaporator coils. Do note the two slots on this side that contain the metal fingers on the evaporator housing that kept the pan on the coil system. You will need to put the pan back on the evaporator later. To install the foam backed pieces on the drain pan, you'll simply take off the paper backing to reveal the sticky portion of the foam and apply it to the dried drain pan. Samsung suggests placing the two smaller strips vertically about a third of the way from each side of the pan, roughly centered with the middle of the pan. For the larger piece, you'll apply it by starting at the bottom and working your way up as far as it will go, making sure the hole for the drain in the middle is centered. I found this a little bit more complicated, but it wasn't hard to do, as the real work was from finding the metal aluminum fingers on the back of the drain pan. Next, we are going to remove the old thermal probe on the defrost heater and replace it with a much larger new one which comes with the drain kit we bought. To remove the old one, I took a pair of side snips or anything you can cut metal with and cut it off of the system. From there, you're just going to slide on the new, much larger probe onto the heater to ensure that the metal tip is routed into the defroster hole. Then you'll take a pair of needle nose pliers and crimp down the metal fingers onto the defrost heater to ensure that it stays in place. Sometimes the defroster probe is all it takes to ensure your Samsung refrigerator won't leak water into the crisper drawers. However, I found that that fix is temporary and the more permanent solution is the entire drain kit fix and the heater installation too. Finally, we are installing the Supco heater. I am starting this by unplugging the defrost heater wire harness on the unit to allow for a little bit more room to work in the cabinet of the refrigerator. To splice on the new defrost heater, you will need to buy what is called displacement connectors. They have a small metal clip in the middle of them that when pressed down with heavy pliers will cut into the electric wire of the primary defrost heater and bridge it with the new defrost heater. This means that when the defroster is running at the bottom of the evaporator, the secondary heater will be warming up the top of the refrigerator where the ball of ice usually forms, which saves your refrigerator. The connector has a small blue flap on it to seal the top of the connection, ensuring that no moisture gets in or that the bridge connector doesn't back out. Make sure that when you finish these connections to seal it, the connection with silicone grease to prevent moisture from ruining the connectors. However, if you buy the Scotch Lock 3M brand that's in the description below, they already have this added so you simply wire the unit and you're done. Now one issue with filming this video had less to do with the work and far more to do with filming in such a cramped space. I only have one good camera angle of putting the displacement connector on the heater wire. In this run through I spliced in the middle of the clear see through plastic tubing but in hindsight I should have put it closer to the connector to the blue wire harness as it would have been quicker. To splice the wires together using the connectors you simply push the heater wire into the blue fitting then slide the defrost wire into the connector. 
there is one side of the connector that all allows the entire wire to pass through and another that is closed on one end. You'll put the defrost wire from the refrigerator into the side allowing for the whole wire, then fit the subco wire into the side with the closed end. Once it is securely in place, you will clamp down on the metal piece with the vice grips or slip jawed pliers or any tool that can ensure a firm fit. Once done, you can then use the tool to secure the top of the cover for the displacement connector onto the whole piece, creating a firm and secure connection. Next, I am mounting the heater to the aluminum and copper line at the top of the evaporator system. The camera angle was not the best, so here is the process zoomed in once I had finished using the high temperature zip ties to secure the heater. In hindsight, again, I should have probably done the heater first before putting the displacement connectors on the wires. The reason for this is that I was not sure if I could cut down the SUPCO heater wire. I found out after doing this installation that you can trim the gray wire down as needed, but you cannot do anything to the black portion, which is the actual heating unit. From here, I am trimming the cable ties on the heater. I am mounting it to contour around where roughly the ball of ice would form. I've seen some techs mount the heater by doubling up the element where the copper tube loops, but in my opinion, as long as it's covering most of the copper tube, you should be in good shape for this modification. Finally, I am attaching the new heater wire to the right defroster wire. One note you need to make in the process of this is to note where the defrost thermistor is. It's this white piece covered in black tape located here. Make sure that it is far away from both the primary defroster as well as the new defroster that we just installed. The new heater is approximately 15 watts and the main heater is 100 plus watts. So place it as far away from both heaters but especially the main heater. The reason for this is that the thermistor will tell the refrigerator control board when the cabinet needs to shut off as the probe has reached a certain temperature to shut the command off. We don't want the system to shut off prematurely, thus the need to move it. One other thing that I'm doing with this is installing additional cable ties to the displacement connectors to make sure that they don't accidentally open and then also put a tie at the bottom of the splice as an ad hoc strain relief. From here, one of the final steps is to reinsert the wires into the wire harness for the defrost heater to make sure that all the electrical connections are secure. From here, I just need to arrange the wire from the heater cord that goes into the displacement connectors. The length of the wire is much longer than what I really needed, so I had to use a few additional cable ties to secure them properly and out of the way. Again, in hindsight, I should have trimmed the wires a bit before splicing them so there would be less excess, but this will not affect the heater negatively in any way. All that is left really is to put the evaporator cover back on, but really before we do this, it would be a good idea to put the unit in forced defrost to test the heater. To do this, watch the companion video on checking error codes in forced mode on the Samsung refrigerator because yours could be different from mine. And to find that, just check the description of this video. The reason that you want to do this is to verify the heaters installed correctly. I let this refrigerator run for a few days and came back to this frost pattern, which shows that I did not fully install the wire correctly, but also why and how the frost can build up in the refrigerator cabinet causing the ball of ice. I found that I did not clamp down the right displacement connector hard enough. It only took about 30 seconds to fix since I didn't put the fridge back entirely to see the frost pattern. Now in forced defrost, you should see the bottom heater easily hit 200 degrees Fahrenheit to take the bulk of the ice away, while the new installed heater on the top cabinet may hit 160 to 170 degrees at maximum. The new heater is only 15 watts versus the main heater at 100 watts. The new heater isn't supposed to defrost the entire cabinet, just take the care of icing problems in the upper part of the cabinet. One final thing before we put the evaporator panel on the refrigerator and finish the video. There is one other alternate fix for this issue. Some technicians are buying two of the Samsung drain kits for the foam back mylar pieces. Allegedly, some technicians are finding that wrapping the copper refrigerant line in the mylar pieces is helping prevent the buildup of frost. If you're uncomfortable with splicing electric lines into your refrigerator using the displacement connectors, this may be a good alternate fix as opposed to the second heater. 
However, from the research and situations that I've seen, the heater works 100% of the time and is a very robust solution. Now, with all of that being said and done, our last step is to finally reinstall the evaporator cover onto the evaporator system. Make sure to plug in the thermistor and fan connections behind the cover in the top left corner and the wire harness as the refrigerator will go crazy if you plug it in without them installed. Just ask me how I know. Also, make sure that all the wires installed or moved are within the evaporator housing and that housing fits snugly back onto the unit, as adding these wires will make it a little bit more snug than what was previously in and on the housing. You'll then put the four or five screws back onto the panel to secure it, and you are all done with this fix. You should now have a fully working system that no longer leaks or has ice buildup on the evaporator panel. I hope this video helps you because I have lost hundreds of dollars myself on replacing components in this type of refrigerator that never actually fixed it and addressed the problem that Samsung created and hasn't really fixed on their own. Thank you so much for watching and make sure you click either the title card that should have popped up or check the description for the force defrost mode. If you have any issues or concerns feel free to leave a comment and I usually do try to respond to anyone that says anything. Have a great day.